Thank you, Philip. Thanks very much. And to the whole Creative Mornings team, thank you so much for having me and for all the work you've put in. It's a, it's a real privilege to be here and, uh, and to get to talk about space. That's, that's what I live for. It's my favorite thing in the world. Um, today, we've been, I've been asked to talk about Beyond. So I've kind of adapted that as I do into a more specific uh, subject in, in how we're going to move beyond Earth, how humans are going to move beyond Earth. So they've given me 20 minutes, which is kind of like a very brief amount of time to do this. So I'm going to do what we do relativistically and just extend that for as long as I possibly can. Um, but there are a few videos that I'm going to have to cut short just to, to keep in the time period. So there's, there's four things I want to cover with you. Is, is first of all, why do we want to move beyond Earth? You know, aren't we comfortable here? Isn't this a good enough place for us? Are there not enough problems on Earth to solve that we should be you know, looking up to the stars and considering what I guess a lot of people would think is a first world issue of you know, leaving the planet? Um, then I'm going to talk to you about suborbital and orbital, which is the next step in our evolution of getting off this planet. If anybody wants to join me on Mars, I'll give you details later. Then we will speak about Mars, Mars itself, which is our next logical step, both as uh, explorers and as pioneers, as, as a civilization that has a long history of, of pioneering new steps and looking at new, new places to explore. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the search for life elsewhere in the universe and what's happening now and what we're doing and what we expect to find and how we're doing that. So why do we want to move beyond Earth? Why would we ever want to leave something comfortable? The image you see on your screen there is a, quite an old artist's impression of what a moon colony would look like, a moon base. And, you know, there's, there's a strong negative argument for leaving the Earth. It's, we could be hit by an asteroid one day. 65 million years ago, a 10-kilometer wide uh, asteroid called KT hit the Yucatan Peninsula and wiped out the dinosaurs. And we came up from the ground, and now we're the dominant species here, and that could happen to us. Um, and and there, there's lots of, of reasons why we would want our civilization to, to survive. But that isn't the real argument. The bottom line is we're dreamers. You know, we, we want to explore. We want to pioneer. We want to know if we're alone. We want to know what else is out there. And for that reason alone, we want to move beyond our Earth. We want to move into our solar system. We want to test the boundaries. We want to understand more. And the only way we can do that, yes, we can use probes to go much further than we ever will be in a single lifetime. But at the same time, you know, it's the touching and feeling and exploring that gives us the real answers. Everything else is instrumentation, it's data, it's statistical analysis, it's probability. Real answers come from being there. And that's really, to me, what this adventure of moving beyond Earth, why we would leave, why we would set up colonies on Mars. It's not because we want to survive as a civilization, although the argument is strong. The only way that we could possibly survive as a civilization is if we became multiplanetary. And there's actually something called Fermi's paradox, which says if there's other life in the universe, why haven't we seen signs of it? Our neck of the universe is only four and a half billion years old, but the whole universe is 14 and a half billion years old. And if we look at all the stats and probability, there should be other civilizations out there. Why haven't we found them? That's Fermi's paradox. And one of the answers to that could be because they never got to leave their planet. And before they got enough time to send out signals or to, to communicate that we would see, they got wiped out by some cataclysmic event. So a lot of people will use that as an argument. But for me, it's looking up, it's exploring. OK, so what's the first stage? Well, we're living in, in what must be the best time for space exploration that we've ever had. It's, it's almost a return to the Apollo generation. Where, you know, I was born during Apollo. Unfortunately, we stopped exploring the moon and everything stagnated for a long time because politics was the reason we went to the moon, not science. And it's taken a while to get back to that, that area of technology. And this has happened because governments around the world turned around and said, you know what, we cannot support fiscally, financially, we cannot support this. We need to collaborate with 
um, the, uh, the private industry. And they created programs like COTS, which then outsourced to SpaceX and Orbital and other companies contracts to deliver cargo to the ISS. Now they're going to be delivering humans to the ISS. And you know, when business gets involved, things accelerate. And the, the, um, the imperatives change. You know, business has to make money. So how is SpaceX going to make money beyond delivering people? Well, they, they need to do some tourism. They need to get people to Mars, which is why Elon is pushing so hard to get people to Mars. And so the, the next step here in, in human evolution is getting you and me up into space, giving that experience. You know, only 12 people have ever been to the moon. Only 350 odd people have ever been to space. It's really a very tiny numbers when you think about it. And space is very hard. It's very difficult. All kinds of physiological effects. Your eyes, your vision goes because of the pressure on your eyes. You can't sleep because every position is a sleeping position in microgravity. You can't lie down and relax. Going to the bathroom used to be a two-hour affair. Now it's a half an hour. You shower with hand towels. It's a difficult, difficult experience, but we all want to have it. So it's going to start off with this very simple six-minute experience where we go up into what's called suborbital. It means you're not really above the common line. You're not in free fall around the Earth, which is a full orbit, but you're high enough that there's no gravity. And the first video I'm going to show you here is, is, is a, um, a conceptual video of what that kind of experience would be. This is from a company called Blue Origin that was started by Jeff Bezos, who founded Amazon. And now he's dedicated himself to space tourism in the form of, um, of these six-minute experiences. But he also, at the same time, there's science going on. So the tourism funds the science with a long-term goal. Jeff's long-term goal is to, to take people to the moon and to set up a moon base. And this is what a Blue Origin experience would be like. Booster 
touchdown. Main parachutes deployed. Anybody else like to do that, or is it just me? All right. Six minutes of that. It's just incredible. And the reason I showed you Blue Origin first is, is they've actually done it. All right. They've sent this, this, this ship up five times. That capsule, in fact, has had seven uses. Relanded the first stage. Uh, completely successful escape test um, with a solid rocket booster in case something went wrong at launch. They're very close. All right. They haven't priced it yet, but roughly it's around about $300,000 for six minutes. A little bit on the pricey side, but five years from now, it's going to be $30,000. And we're all going to be able to experience it. And you know, a lot of this tourism that we're talking about is actually funding the next stage of science, the next stage of, of exploration. Of course, um, it's not just Jeff and, and, uh, sorry, and Blue Origin that are doing this. Um, there's Virgin Galactic, Richard Branson. Unfortunately, they had a, a, a terrible disaster which destroyed their, their last um, craft uh, pilot error, unfortunately. But the amazing thing is that the pilot survived. You know, the co-pilot unfortunately died in this, but the pilot survived. It's the first ever successful crash um, on launch that a, that a pilot survived. And, and it was an amazing feat. But of course, they're doing it. There's X-Core Lynx. Um, which is uh, a, a European uh, space exploration solution. Um, and so there's, there's lots of these guys who are doing this commercial space tourism. And, uh, and now you may have heard of SpaceX. This is going now from suborbital to orbital. They announced that they're carrying two people around the moon in 2018. Has anybody heard of that? All right, so, so these guys have paid somewhere in the region of Elon hasn't said the exact details, but the crew has been selected. They're doing a physical. There's a backup crew for this. He said it's roughly the same price of getting an astronaut to the, to the space station. So they've paid $70 million. They're going to go um, from Earth around the moon, do a slingshot, natural slingshot around the moon, come back to Earth. It's about two, a week to two weeks alone, this couple alone in the spacecraft. And they're planning to do this in 2018. The, the underlying purpose is to test the Dragon capsule, which is what he wants to use to send in 2018 to the, to the moon. It'll be after they use Dragon to deliver um, NASA astronauts to the space station. But there you go. If you've got $70 million lying around, you can go on a quick trip around. Nice honeymoon, maybe, around, around the moon. And, uh, and of course, we've got Bigelow. And Charles Bigelow is this eccentric hotelier. American All Suites Hotels he owns. And uh, NASA gave up on their Habitat uh, contract when uh, the funding was cut after the credit crunch. And so he took over all the patents on condition that he had exclusivity. And as a hotelier building Habitats, where, what's his natural inclination? He wants to build a space hotel. So we've got Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 were the first two uh, Habitats that went into orbit. In fact, Genesis 2 has a South African scorpion on it. To, to test a, a group of these scorpions, which is to test the, the effects on, uh, of them on space, or the effect of space on the, on the scorpions. He then put BEAM aboard the International Space Station, and they're testing that right now. But the end goal for him is to have a commercial hotel. So where are we, 10, 15 years from now? Let's go to space for a week, you know? Uh, perfect. In fact, I've, I've collaborated with people in... Um, in Scandinavia, and, and there's this concept flying around of let's go to the ICE Hotel for Christmas, take off from Spaceport Sweden, Lapland, go up to, to the Space Hotel, come down and land at Spaceport South Africa, which would hopefully be at OTB and Hermana, somewhere around there, go on safari. Could there possibly be a better holiday, Christmas, New Year holiday? Can you imagine? So, you know, this is how we can help fund 
the exploration, the science. And this is why space tourism is actually so prominent in the news. And that's the next step. Right, but the next real step for science is, is how, do we, how do we go to Mars? How are we going to get there? And, you know, plans have been in the work for a, vi for a very long time. And I'm going to talk to you about three specific plans. There's more than this, of course. But there's, there's three specific. The first is the very formal journey to Mars. Um, it's the first image on the left-hand side, technology, exploration, science. You can see that that's a NASA poster, but actually there's 35 space agencies involved. Uh, the European Space Agency itself is made up of about 18 different agencies, but it will take the whole scientific community to, to um, complete a successful return mission to Mars. And the journey to Mars is their undertaking to get there somewhere in the 2030s as a combined effort. And there's all kinds of amazing developments that are going on now. Now, the difference between commercial and, and, um, and public uh, space is that NASA owns all of its patents. It pays for its developments. It develops to a different standard. So Lockheed is the, uh, supplies the Orion capsule, which is NASA's capsule, whereas SpaceX provides a Dragon capsule, which is now getting human rated. Boeing is also providing a, a capsule which is their own. Um, because it's such a high standard and because it has to be a return mission, it's a lot more complex. To send somebody one way is very easy. To get them back is very hard and lots of implications. The one-way journey is called Mars One. You may have heard of it. We have four South Africans who are in the final hundred. That if Mars One actually gets, including my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Adriana Maria, um, uh, it's very possible, 20, 20 uh, what, 5% chance. Yeah, that the, fir the, first, the first person on Mars could be a South African if Mars One is successful. Okay, unfortunately, the history of Mars One is a, a bit shaky, to say the least. Started off as a concept for a reality show. Was actually, the idea was that they were going to send up cameras with these crews of four, and we're going to be able to watch real time people taking a one-way mission to Mars. Personally, I don't believe, I get asked often, would I go on a one-way mission to Mars? And my answer is very simple. I don't believe there'll be any one-way missions. For us, there will always be a return. The real question is, what happens to the first child born on Mars? And you can go back into science fiction, and you can read um, Heinlein or, or many other science fiction writers. That's going to be a real problem. No Martian-born child will be able to survive Earth's gravity. Um, and so that really becomes the one-way ticket, is when we start. You know, we're, we're built and designed to survive in this gravity. Microgravity is terrible on our bodies. We lose 1% of our bone mass every month we spend in space. You know, we, we, if we don't exercise three hours a day, you start to lose muscle mass. So gravity is essential for us. So Mars One, great concept, great publicity. Will they ever get there? The science is a bit shaky. The business model is a bit shaky. And then my personal hero, my Neil Armstrong, as Philip says, is, is Elon Musk. Absolute genius. Never mind what he's doing with cars and what he's doing with Hyperloops and, and, and solo power and the gigafactories and stuff like that. He's committed every cent, publicly said every cent that he has will be spent on helping humans become a multi-planetary society, civilization. He is devoted to spend everything he has on getting us to Mars. Of course, that's a good business model because he intends to be the carrier. But at the same time, what he's trying to do is encourage the rest of industry to come along with us. It's no good taking us to Mars if we don't have an agricultural industry there, if we don't have a medical industry. In fact, we're even going to need lawyers, unfortunately, on Mars, because they're going to need to write a constitution. Okay, there's going to be a whole new way of living and a whole new independence when we do this. But the amazing thing about colonizing another planet is it's not for astronauts. They're going to get us there. But once we're there, it's for everybody else. We've got to do things from scratch. We've got to learn how to live again in a different environment, doing different things. And that's why, for me, it's so essential that we get the science of living in space into almost every professional training program that there is. Because just 10 years from now, we're going to have waiters, we're going to have DJs, we're going to have entertainers, we're going to have hairdressers, all working on space hotels. It's not just going to be astronauts doing science in an ISS. Okay. So this is Elon's bold plan, announced last year at the International Astronautical Congress. This is the interplanetary transport system that Elon is developing. Um, the amazing thing about this is that, as a typical engineer, 
he didn't come out with the hype first and say, this is what we want to do, and then go back to the drawing room and say, how are we going to do this? He has built and tested the fuel tank that is on this. That's the hardest construction, actually the oxygen tank that is on this ITS. The gimbaled rocket system exists and has been tested. This system is about two years away from initial testing, and that's when he decided to announce it. So this is ITS, this is Elon Musk's vision, which is actually not really his initially. It was actually Werner von Braun, who is the Nazi German rocket scientist who developed the V1, V2, who the Americans brought over, and then he developed the Apollo program. And this was his vision to Mars, and this is what he saw coming after Apollo. And when this didn't happen, when the US, uh, when Nixon government pulled funding for NASA uh, and Vietnam came about, is when Werner von Braun uh, resigned from NASA. But most of the concepts that you'll see here were actually his. And he did the maths way back then, way back in the 60s.
you can see, it's um, a lot of challenges to make that happen. But uh, you know, we have every faith that, that he'll be able to do that. And the first thing they've got to do is obviously they've got to build a fuel plant there to use the water that's on Mars to create fuel to bring us back. But we don't need to have as much thrust to escape Mars's atmosphere, which is a third of the gravitational pull and 2% of the air resistance that, that Earth has. Um, and I mean, one of the things I haven't mentioned here is, is one of the reasons we would go to Mars is also commercial. I don't know if you guys have heard about the uh, space mining industry or, or asteroid mining. But uh, just to give you an example, we, we've spotted a near-Earth asteroid. There's three types of asteroids, and, and one of them is, is carbon-based. And we've, we've spotted one with enough platinum on it, which is more than the total amount of platinum ever mined on Earth in one small asteroid going around in a near-Earth orbit. So asteroid mining will become a huge thing. There's a, a series on um, Netflix called The Edge, which is basically a war between Mars and Earth about mining the, the, the asteroid belts and the colonies on, on the asteroids there. And yeah, it's straight out of science fiction, but it's also science fact. It's the future. So now beyond, beyond where we can go now, this is where we're reliant on our instrumentation. But I thought this is very important to bring up because the scientists behind this, three of the scientists behind the search for life are in this month's Time 100 most influential people on Earth. And they deserve to be there. But our first search for life is still going to be here in our solar system. We, um, we're discovering things every day here on Earth. In fact, we know more about what is going on up in the skies, up in the heavens, than we know what's going on at the bottom of our ocean. But one of the most amazing discoveries we found is that life finds a way in the deepest, darkest trenches of our ocean where we thought no life cause it could exist because no light exists. We found organisms that are um, being created from the volcanic activity at the bottom and are living on a, a hybrid so they don't need the light for, um, for life. And that led us to understand a little bit more about how life is created and the fact that we need to look for, for hydrogen to, to find life. And now we've discovered these amazing plumes that are coming out of Saturn's moon Enceladus. And they're all, always coming out of the same place, which indicates to us that under the ice of Enceladus, under the frozen ocean, it is a water world, an ocean world. We're an ocean world as well. And we've discovered these hydrogen plumes, which leads us to believe there's volcanic activity there. And if there's volcanic activity, there could be life. And this was announced just two weeks ago. You know, we know that there are oceans on Titan, but there are oceans of methane. So there was a plan. I saw another one of, of Saturn's 62 moons. Um, another, another area we want to go and explore, we were going to drop a submarine in there and go around seeing if we could find any signs of life in a methane ocean. Europa on Jupiter, one of the four Galilean moons on Jupiter, but Jupiter has 67 moons in total. There's another place where we're seeing hydrogen plumes, another potential for life. And if you, you listen to Ellen Stofan, who's the, the chief scientist of NASA, she has declared outright that within 10 years we're going to find life elsewhere in our universe. That is an incredibly bold statement. To me, that says they've already found it, All right, that they're just confirming the science, which can take that long. So we're not talking about intelligent, sentient beings like ourselves. We're talking about a, a, at an orga organism level, bacteria perhaps. And we want to make sure that we didn't put that life there in the first place. Bacteria can survive in space. And when we've landed probes before, it's quite possible that those probes have had bacterial life on them and that we've contaminated other planets, which is why um, Cassini now is doing its dives through Saturn's rings and then is going to crash into the planet to make sure it's destroyed and doesn't contaminate any of Saturn's moons. So those are the, the, the three moons that we're going to explore next with, with an expectation that we might find answers of, of how life is created and that it does exist elsewhere in our solar system, never mind elsewhere in the world. But you may have heard of the incredible discoveries in the last 12 months of Proxima b. Now, Proxima b is a planet we've discovered that's orbiting our closest star, Proxima Centauri, only four light years away. And I don't know if anybody's heard of the Breakthrough uh, Project, but Breakthrough is, is started by Yuri Milner, a Russian billionaire, backed by Stephen Hawking and um, 
Mark Zuckerberg's involved as well and various other guys. And there's a couple of projects. One's called the Breakthrough Message. That is that if you write a message to, um, to an alien civilization, they'll give you a million dollars. So all of, all of the uh, composers, writers here, let's get cracking. There's a million dollars on offer for the right message to send to alien civilizations. Hopefully they don't get the Voyager tapes or the Voyager discs because that's pretty old stuff. There's Breakthrough Listen, which is actually devoting time. Although you think we've been, SETI's been around forever and we've seen Contact and we've seen all these other movies, we've explored less than 1% of what we can see out there. We just don't have the, 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 the telescope time, the radio telescope time. So they've pumped millions of dollars into upping that, the amount of time we listen. That's called Breakthrough Listen. And then we have Breakthrough Starshot. And Breakthrough Starshot actually came before the Proxima B announcement. And the idea is to take these tiny little chips, all right, about this big, and to shoot them in the thousands to Proxima Centauri, our nearest neighbor. And we're going to use lasers that are based on Earth. And we're going to fire these lasers at these little sails, as you can see on the right-hand side. It's a little um, solar sail, star sail. And we power them with the lasers, and we think we can speed them up to a fifth of the speed of light. And that means we can get to, to Proxima Centauri, our nearest neighbor, in what would take four years at the speed of light, which we're nowhere near, but we can get there in 20 years. And within 20 years, we can have all of these mini probes, thousands and thousands of them, exploring Proxima Centauri. And now we've found a planet in what we call the Goldilocks Zone where life could exist, where a sentient life could exist, at Proxima B. Um, and then, most recently, just 40 light years away, we found a white dwarf called Trappist-1. And around this white dwarf, Trappist-1, we've discovered seven planets. And of those planets, three of them, seven Earth-sized planets, Earth-like planets, three of them in the Goldilocks zone three planets around one star in the Goldilocks zone. But what's even more important than that is that white dwarfs are the most prolific type of star in our, in our galaxy. Our sun has a lifespan of about nine billion years. We're halfway through. Four and a half billion years from now, our sun's not big enough to go supernova, but it will run out of, of hydrogen and helium. It will expand, it will destroy the Earth, and it then will contract into a neutron star. It's not going to make a black hole. White dwarfs will live for 100 billion years. And they're everywhere. And this is the first evidence we have of planets able to live around these white dwarfs. They're much smaller and much cooler than our sun. So these habitable planets are much closer to their, sun, to their star than our Earth is to the sun. But the great thing about this is we now know that it is possible for civilizations to have existed the entire 14 and a half billion years. Of the, of the existence of the universe. Of course, it's much less than 100 billion years. So there's no way that, um, that any white, we've never seen a white dwarf um, disappear. We've never seen one die. And we don't expect to, because they will live for at least 100 billion years. So that's a big step. That's a big step for us to, to realize that there is a potential home for our civilization around one of these, if ever we had to leave. Could take a couple of generations to get there, but it's a nice thing to know. And then finally, a lot of this has been made possible by the Kepler telescope, and, and the lady in charge of the Kepler telescope is the highest on that top 100 list. Uh, Kepler has discovered over 3,600 planets, exoplanets, around various stars, which we never knew existed before. And it's thanks to the work of Kepler and, and the successor to Kepler and Hubble, which is called the James Webb Telescope, which will launch in 2018 or 2019, and we expect to get even more. It's going to sit at a Lagrange point where it, uh, there's no um, pollution from Earth's light and from the sun, and we can deep stare deep into the universe all the way back to the beginning of time. And I know that sounds like a strange thing to equate, staring back in time, but that's what you do when you're looking at the universe because of the time it takes light to get to us. So we can look all the way back to the Big Bang. We've done it already, with the, micro, the cosmic microwave background. That was actually first discovered because they were looking for gamma rays, and they thought that birds had pooped on the dish at Bell Lab. And they went and cleaned the poop, but the static was still there. And we discovered that the sound from the beginning of creation permeated everywhere around us, across everywhere on Earth, all at the same time. 
And that was a huge discovery. And now James Webb is going to take us back right into those very first seconds of the Big Bang. And that's <laughs> beyond. <laughs>